Isis Keist and uh, also all of you who are present here this morning. It's a genuinely splendid occasion. Uh, I think I've only met one previous uh, occasion that was this ambitious organized by undergraduates and that was a group that uh, joined together both Harvard and MIT. So I have to say that ISIS alone seems to be surpassing uh, the activities of Harvard and MIT put together and for that you deserve special congratulations. It's also a tremendous honor and a pleasure to be speaking about a topic that as uh, our uh, chair for this session uh, indicated has been uh, my life work in a sense, science, technology, and society, I was given the particular challenge of talking about science, technology, and democracy, and that, of course, draws together uh, three of the biggest concepts, the biggest uh, forces in, in the social world that we could possibly be thinking about. Uh, so to do that in something like 45 minutes is uh, a huge challenge. Um, it's further going to be difficult because I don't want to talk in abstractions and platitudes. I want to give you some concrete examples and cases about why the science technology society interaction matters and why perfect alliance is a very noble ideal, uh, but we're got, all going to have to work very, very hard if we're going to aim for that kind of perfection. Uh, so I will be drawing in the course of the talk on some of the results of my own personal research, but also be talking in a more general way about a variety of problems. So that um, extremely um, professional video with which we began the morning, uh, made a point that was also going to be the opening point of my talk. Science, technology, science and technology are everywhere among us, and for a social scientist to make this observation is a little strange, that we cannot actually think about society today without thinking about the role of science and technology in there. So my slides will not be as professional as your video, but it's worth remembering that the very fact that I'm here and talking to you is itself a technological miracle. So all these different little machines brought me here. Uh, I have always been known to have a rather soft voice, uh, and therefore for uh, hundreds of people to hear me in the room, you need some amplification. Even that is not a straightforward thing, and uh, particularly uh, women academics uh, who often have to make their way in a male world quite value the fact that our voices can be amplified uh, to an extent where they sound as authoritative as anybody else's in the room. So one way to approach the democracy point is to think a little bit historically. We've had the scientific revolution with us now for hundreds of years. And one of the principles of the scientific revolution was that science could be left more or less by itself to govern itself. Now, why did we think that science was capable of self-governance? Well, a very important point there was that science was supposed to be skeptical. People don't, are not supposed to believe results until they have questioned them. This is enshrined in the practice of peer review. Science also was supposed to be humble. It was not supposed to take any of the truths that it uncovered as being universal. Scientists themselves, great scientists from time, from the beginning of the scientific revolution, have always said that we are making guesses. We're trying to get as close to nature as we can. But our results are always provisional. Our current science can be overturned by better science, better knowledge as it comes along. Science became experimental. So don't accept dogma, don't accept doctrine, simply because people are telling you that's what the way, that's the way it ought to be. Rather, try it out, see if the world actually believes in the way in which you're wanting the world to believe. And that too is a sort of humble attitude, it's saying, don't take for granted what I say, look instead at what I do. And I was interested that our president, Yogi Lee, talked about civic engagement without knowing that it was actually going to be a term in a slide of mine. 
uh, because science from very early on has actually striven to do things for the public good. So for all of these reasons, we haven't really thought about science and democracy very earnestly and very deeply for a long time because we thought science could be left alone, could govern itself. But today, I think the situation has changed. Partly the situation has changed because Today, we don't really only want to talk about science. In fact, in my field of science and technology studies, people routinely talk about techno-science because the theory is that you don't actually get science without technology, you don't get technology without science, and you may as well have what the English call a portmanteau word, a word that's collapsed from two other words, to stand for the combination. So techno-science tries to capture that idea. Now, if you look at techno-science, which includes all those mundane technologies like cars and airplanes and amplifiers and laptops and so on that I showed you before, you find that techno-science does not have the same virtues that science had historically. So instead of being skeptical, techno-science is often mission-oriented. It's actually trying to solve a problem, and it has ambitions that it's actually going to solve those problems. Techno-science is incredibly ambitious. Uh, these days, there is a university in California, of course it would be in California, called the Singularity University. Some of you may have heard of it, and it invites students to come in and solve problems that would be beneficial for a billion people at a time. That this is not a particularly humble attitude. Uh, further, many of the things that techno science achieves are irreversible. So, we already heard about nuclear weapons this morning and the radioactive wastes from those weapons and from the peaceful uses of the atom. We don't know what to do with them. They last for hundreds of thousands of years and they are, in effect, irreversible technological choices. The same would be true if we do away with biodiversity. On a huge scale, the same might be true if we engage in geoengineering. So these are not humble approaches to problem solving. And then last but not least, much of what techno-science does is not controllable. It's not controllable even by the extremely intelligent, extremely skillful, and courageous people who are assembled in this room. So let me talk very briefly about um, the ways in which technology escapes our control and then come back and cycle back to the problem of democracy and discuss why the perfect alliance may be a little bit more difficult than we imagine. So there is a very current and popular theory about technology called technological determinism and it says that built into technologies is a line of control, that technologies in effect move and develop independently, autonomously, once we get them going, and they then regulate our behavior. Now, I don't want to believe in technological determinism for reasons that I'll discuss with you, but nevertheless, one can't forget that technologies, in fact, do play a role in control. This is one of the cartoons that happened after the revolutions in the Arab world that were called the Arab Spring. And there you see a pictorial illustration of technological determinism at work. I'm sure that many of you in this room have heard the idea of the Twitter revolution, for instance. So the idea was that all these individuals who had been scattered in their opposition to authoritarian dictatorial forms of government were only able to come together because of social networking tools, which were all mediated through technology. So that's a very nice illustration of technological determinism. Now, I do think technologies control us, but I think that the starting point of our discussion as academics and as young scholars is how, what are the ways in which those controls happen? And what I want to say to you, if there's one lesson to take away, it's that the machine, the mechanical parts of technology, those are not where the controls are. The controls are in the designers, in the will, in the wishes, in the uh, imaginations that we ourselves build into our mechanical worlds. So how does technoscience control us? Let's take a primitive sort of example, traffic lights. Uh, I'm a pedestrian very often in my own home city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, so I notice what goes on with the lights 
uh, quite uh, uh, acutely almost every day. Uh, this is a picture, as you see, from London, where the traffic lights during the London Olympics were re phased so that the red lights would last longer than they would normally. Uh, and this was designed to keep traffic out of the inner city. So a very simple system like traffic lights can be used as a device for crowd control and can be used in you know, quite uh, far-reaching population-wide ways in a major metropolis like London. But while you're looking at traffic lights, you may forget that there's an alternative technology that also moves intersections, and that is in British English called the roundabout. In America, it's often called the traffic circle. Uh, what's interesting about the traffic circle is that it isn't meant to be linear in the way that an intersection regulated by traffic lights is. And in fact, in the circle, you may not actually need a light. Of course, to those of us who've been watching the city of London and the environments in, the, in Britain over a long period of time, it's now frightening that some roundabouts actually have traffic lights in them because they've become so busy. But the older theory was that you could just use the flow itself to regulate itself and you didn't need the lights. But in any case, this is a very simple example of one technology, but in the discussion you see that that technology, that technological system has alternatives, it regulates human behavior, but it does so in complex ways. But I don't know how many people in this room would feel capable of designing either a roundabout or a traffic light system. So in that sense, we don't have democratic control over this very everyday technology that we need all the time. Many of our most sophisticated technologies also escape our control. It is interesting to recall that two of the space shuttles that the United States government poured a great deal of money and effort into led to uh, disasters of different sorts. And that second picture, which I don't know why it's turned out red, maybe it's an Apple IBM interface problem, but in any case, that was meant to be a reconstruction scene of the Columbia, the second shuttle, just to show how in the effort to get the thing back together after the accident, you suddenly see all the parts of this extremely complex technological system, all the little separate black boxes and the separate workings that were not visible when the thing sits by itself as a completed technological system. And of course, sitting here in Korea, you don't need to be reminded that sometimes technological accidents happen at such scale that they can produce a disaster that is of global proportions. If the radiation level in the Pacific Ocean goes up by some measurable amount, and that has consequences for fish populations and so on and so forth, we're talking about effects that are not only disastrous for people in and around Fukushima, they are problematic for people who are sitting very far away indeed, and for all of us as human beings who care what happens elsewhere in the world. Moreover, although people thought that science was sitting in an ivory tower and was apolitical, it has turned out to be very far from the case. And just in very recent American history, we've had a number of reminders that what science you do and how you do it can be intensely political. That is a young man I know, for those of you who are interested in science communication, he is an English literature graduate of Yale University, but then he became one of the major science writers in America. And shortly before uh, the uh, election of Barack Obama, he started writing uh, books about the sort of alliance between the Republican Party and anti-science movements in America, and his book, The Republican War on Science, in particular, became a national bestseller. Uh, so it was not surprising when the new president elected in 2008 reasserted a different kind of attitude towards science, and he has repeatedly visited the National Academy of Sciences. This is on the occasion of his visit of the 150th anniversary of the National Academy. But the point, uh, the point worth making is that it's not that one side is political and the other side is not. 
It's that science is politics and it's big politics and presidents in the United States and I dare say in many other countries in the world, including this one, see that what kind of science you do, what kind of techno science you do is a political set of choices and drives uh, political decision making in certain directions and certain ways. So this is a very famous quotation from Barack Obama's inaugural address, and it picks up on some of the themes that uh, this meeting has been convened to discuss. And so I will read it to you because it became something that the scientific community, which had felt battered during the George W. Bush administration, the scientific community felt that here was a promise being made that finally uh, it could count on. We will restore science to its rightful place and wield technology's wonders to raise healthcare's quality and lower its cost. We will harness the sun and the winds and the soil to fuel our cars and run our factories, and we will transform our schools and colleges and universities to meet the demands of a new age. All this we can do, all this we will do. So on a national scale, those of you who follow American news with any degree of care will know that one of the most controversial policy attempts of the Obama administration has been to reform healthcare policy. So he himself as president has met the thorn in the rose as it were, so you can promise the perfect alliance, but it's hard to deliver on it. I myself, as somebody who lives in universities and has been trying for 30 years to get adequate recognition for the field of science, technology, and society, will tell you that the promise that transform our schools and colleges and universities to meet the demands of the new age sounds very nice. But please join me in the effort because it's not that easy in practice. Now, I want to take you through an example to suggest that the story is perhaps even more complicated than President Obama thought when he made that very nice inaugural address promise. And this is generally built around the world of biotechnology, which today is one of the most promising sectors of techno-scientific and social development. So biotechnology is supposed to solve a great many problems for us, and biotechnology itself is a number of different things. So it's in pharmaceuticals, it's in bioinformatics, it's in bioagriculture, including things like biofuels, and it is in synthetic biology, which is supposed to build um, life starting at a different point, starting with engineering, rather than the principles of uh, molecular biology and genetics. So what we've discovered over the years, years is that the attempt to regulate biotechnology so that it's beneficial and not harmful has been intensely political, and my own research, centering on three countries that are supposed to be very similar, has shown that in area after area, uh, what you're regulating when you're regulating biotechnology is differently understood by national governments. The three countries I've looked at in detail are Germany, Britain, and the United States, and all of them have a great deal in common. Nevertheless, when you get to particular policy areas, the ways in which these national governments have approached the regulation of biology and biotechnology has diverged very uh, dramatically. So with regard to genetically modified crops and foods, there's been a basic question, should we regulate these as processes or as products? And I'll lead you through that discussion in a little more detail in a minute. With regard to abortion, which is very closely tied to embryo-based research, as probably many of you know, in America, abortion has been an intensely political question. In other countries, less so. With regard to assisted reproduction, which produces in vitro fertilization, but it also produces extra embryos from which embryo-based derivatives can be made. Again, the policy systems of the three countries that I've looked at, plus many other ones, vary radically in the ways in which they treat the products of assisted reproduction. The same is true of stem cells, a topic that has had a great deal of resonance in this country. The same is true about how bioethics itself gets organized and the principles on which bioethics is managed. And last but not least, something that you may hear about 
at other times in the conference, intellectual property around the products of biotechnology is treated very differently in different countries. So just a few months or a few weeks ago, the US Supreme Court handed down a very major decision saying that genes occurring in nature cannot be patented for something like uh, 40, 30 years since the first major Supreme Court decision on patenting, people had insisted, companies had insisted that genes could be patented. It took 30 years for the Supreme Court to come up with a different argument and a different position on this. But the point is that intellectual property law is shifting and evolving, and it's evolving in ways that reflect our changing understandings of what is at stake in that arena. So now I want to walk you very quickly through three different regulatory frameworks for genetically modified um, products, particularly in agriculture. And I want to show you that these three countries that I've looked at in detail differ in salient ways in how they think about this issue. In America, uh, we have adopted what we call the product-based framework, and that has a certain set of principles attached to it. The basic principle is there's nothing strange or regulatable about the process of genetic modification per se. The process does not need any special attention from lawyers, policymakers, or anybody else. It's only the products that need that attention. Moreover, most of the products of biotechnology already were made in other ways. They were made through chemistry, they were made through other industrial processes, and so we do not need new law. So the United States met the genetic modification revolution without enacting any new laws because of these principles that America has believed in at up, uppermost policy levels. Now that has led to some strange consequences for democracy. So this is from a letter that was written uh, 14 years or so ago, but I think many people in the biotech industry would still buy this. Last year there was a referendum on whether to label genetically modified products in California and it lost because of a huge push by the agribusiness industry against that labeling requirement. And they said labeling of biotech foods could lead to the very kind of consumer confusion that labels are designed to prevent. Now think about what this means for democracy because what the biotech industry is saying here is that if you put the label GM on, on people will not be able to evaluate this. People are incapable, they will become confused, and they will not know what to do. And this has consequences in very mundane ways. This is a yogurt container top in America that has the following label on it. Guaranteed by our farmers, made with milk from cows, not treated with RBST. RBST is genetically modified bovine growth hormone. So you're not allowed to say this product does not contain bovine growth hormone that is genetically modified because there is a law against saying that because the genetically modified product is supposed to be the same as the non-genetically modified product. So if you should happen to think that natural yogurt should not have genetic modification associated with it, you have to settle for a label that looks more like that and then they have to put in the separate little stuff below to make sure that they're complying with the law. While it is believed that no difference can be shown in milk from RBST, that's the, that's the uh, recombinant version, uh, from RBST treated cows and non-treated cows, our farmers guarantee they do not use RBST. So it's a very convoluted way of getting around uh, what seems on its face a democratic idea, that if people want to know it's genetically modified, they have a right to know it's genetically modified. Now, if you cross the other ocean, the Atlantic, and go to England, you find that the British took a different kind of action in the 1990s to show that they did not particularly like genetically modified crops. There you see somebody who I believe is a peer of the British realm, somebody sitting in the House of Lords, who was engaging in civil disobedience by um, digging up uh, the uh, 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 recombinant DNA, genetically modified crops, in, a, in an experimental plot. And the reason he was doing it was to create publicity. Again, this is about science communication. 
the British social analysts have started calling this uninvited participation. That is, this is democracy, they haven't been invited to give their opinion, so they're expressing themselves through civil disobedience. Another one that I like was uh, this one, where Greenpeace organized a dump of genetically modified corn outside 10 Downing Street uh, when uh, Tony Blair was still uh, president. And uh, Bill refers, of course, to Bill Clinton, who was president of the United States, and so it's imported corn that they're trying to keep out. And maybe some of you are familiar enough with the English language and its idioms to understand what Tony, don't swallow Bill's seed, is trying to get at. But let's say that it was during uh, a scandal that was engulfing the Clinton administration. And uh, this is a reference to that. But the point is that in Britain, citizens made it quite clear that they would not go along with the kind of settlement that had been achieved in America. And as a result, Britain adopted what one might call the process framework for dealing with genetically modified crops and other products. And so unlike America, British politics has accepted that genetic modification is uh, is interesting enough, a deviation from earlier kinds of industrial processes, that it does need, that it would benefit from uh, regulation directed specifically toward that. And from that, the democratic consequences have also diverged. In 2003, Britain held a very large nationwide consultation called GM Nation. Uh, there's no parallel to that sort of thing uh, in America or in any other country. It was as if they had to reinvent their democratic processes and procedures because of this kind of public protest over technology. If you turn to Germany, you find a somewhat different set of ideas. In Germany, people um, are still, the biotech industry is still dealing with the fact that Germany had a particularly horrendous history with genetics and with genetic science during World War II. And the German public has been very worried from the beginning that there could be a similar alliance between technoscience and the state again, and this is what they want to avoid. And therefore, in Germany, unlike America, very special laws had to be enacted to establish the rules of the game by which the state could sponsor developments in technology. So you'll notice that these are very big, basic policy differences. If one country chooses to meet a new technological development without enacting any new laws, and another country says, we need new legislation to go forward with this, these are quite radical and basic differences. They're not just superficial uh, alterations of the landscape. And if you look at the kind of thing that the Germans did, they established, uh, whereas Britain had a nationwide consultation to consult all the people, the Germans brought together experts and created a special commission. But in that special commission, this is back in, 2000, in the year 2000 already, they had an open online chat so that people could talk to the experts and sort of uh, affect the ways in which they were thinking. So if you sum up uh, uh, some of these differences. And, you know, another point that's worth making is that they're continuous. I mean, that is, these are ongoing kinds of differences. And when you get a new technology, such as cloning, you find that even today, uh, things have not converged. It's not that countries are regulating the products of uh, cloning or somatic cell nuclear transfer in the same way just because it's the same set of technological interventions. And in fact, here is a very quick listing of some of the differences. So in Britain, there was a law saying what was an embryo. And when cloned embryos were created, British law decided that it made no difference how you created it. There was no difference for legal purposes between a, a natural embryo created through ordinary reproduction and a cloned embryo. In America, there's been no legal decision about what is a natural embryo versus a cloned embryo, but the uh, American research environment has been quite permissive, and the only thing it doesn't allow 
is human cloning, but the place where American policy has not been permissive is the use of federal money to support research in universities where this kind of research is being done, and that is a whole complex story in and of itself. In Germany, this kind of research is prohibited, and the creation of embryos in this way is prohibited. Italy used to be permissive, but then became non-permissive once the Catholic Church weighed in and decided to have a voice in the situation. And in Canada also it is prohibited because Canada in some of these uh, issues tends to want to diverge from the United States and to have a different set of mechanisms of its own. So how different countries decide what is ethical about technology and how to control what's ethical about technology tends to diverge from one place to another. And this is just a very quick, very crude summary of some of these differences. So science and technology are always producing new things. And from the standpoint of law, policy, and democratic thinking, one of the problems is how should we think about these new things? Are they like something else that we already know, or are they unlike something else that we already know? Um, during the period when people are trying to figure out the answer to those questions, there is ambiguity. And one place where people differ culturally is in how those ambiguities are treated and how those ambiguities are resolved. So if you look at America versus Germany, you find over and over again in all kinds of different technological sectors that the American approach, the US American approach, is to say, go ahead, create these ambiguous things, and then we'll sort out after the fact what to do with them legally and politically. Whereas in Germany, the attitude is far more, we should not be violating the normative system the system of principles, the system of ethics that we already have in place, we should make sure that we have clear rules before we start creating entities so that the entities themselves will not be ambiguous, so that state control will always be present and will always be, um, 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 so the state will always be accountable to clear principles in carrying out its responsibilities. Moreover, you find in the US a very great reluctance to centralize policy making at the level of the federal government. More or less the only control that the federal government has on scientific and technological research in the United States is the funding mechanism. It can decide to fund some kinds of research, it can decide not to fund some kinds of research. But many of the actual regulations saying this is how you should organize the activity are actually carried out at the state level. There's a big difference with the UK and with Germany where the policy making is done for the entire country by a centralized system of laws and rules. Um, I've had German lawyer friends who say to me, you know, how is it that in America you can have some research that's permitted with private funds but prohibited with federal funds. How can it make sense to a scientific researcher that if she walks into this lab, which is funded with public funds, she cannot do this research, but if she walks into that lab, which is funded with private money, she can do exactly the same research. It's in the same university, just you know, the funding streams are different. That's a kind of intellectual inconsistency that German policy and German law, for instance, does not tolerate. Now, the point is not simply that there are differences. The point is that these are democratic societies that have come to very different conclusions about how it is that you manage these kinds of evolving frontiers uh, that science and technology are constantly creating for us. Uh, similarly, the question of which should the institutions that govern the technology be public or private, this is something that is very different across countries. Um, South Korea, for instance, treats its nuclear power management in a very different way from the way the US treats it, and uh, Germany, again, is a very different case than the UK as well. And all of this comes down to the bottom line, which is very important. Where does accountability, where does the responsibility for developing new things, ambiguous things, boundary crossing things, ultimately lie? In a democracy, this is one of the central questions. 
Have we given power to somebody over our lives without retaining some kind of control? In a democratic society, the fundamental presumption is if you've given power to somebody, there should be some kind of control. Uh, for elected governments, the control is through the elections and through various other political mechanisms. For science and technology, where is that power? And the question is, who do science and technology have to talk back to? To whom are they accountable? And again, if you look across countries, you find that the answer to that question, question varies across democratic nations. So in America, it's very often not quite clear where the accountability system is, or to whom science and technology are accountable. Whereas in Britain, it's pretty clear at the end of the day, it's parliamentary accountability that is key. For instance, if you take a very recent case a few years ago, some of you may have heard that climate scientists in a British university had their emails hacked, and those emails were made public, and there was a big scandal. So in the UK, there was a parliamentary inquiry into what had happened to see if the scientists had acted responsibly or not. In the United States, a committee of national academies was set up to see whether the scientists had behaved properly or not. So there's a very big different difference for democracy, whether you're letting parliament, the legislature, make these kinds of determinations, or whether you're having the scientific community police itself when a, when a major conflict like that arises. In Germany, very much is delegated to experts, but the experts themselves are often selected by the political establishment. So in that sense, the experts are more directly politically accountable than they are in the United States. So these, this is what the stories I'm telling you are based on years of research in many, many different sectors. But the bottom line point is that every single democratic nation I know has its own set of answers, historical, grounded in particular institutions, and grounded in particular assumptions about how democracy works and how democratic control ought to be exercised. Right, so against the backdrop of the things I've been telling you, what should we be doing as we rethink science, technology, and democracy together? The first point I've made is that developments in science and technology and techno-science are not just technical, not just a matter for experts, but also political in a variety of different ways. The second point is that there are divergences among nations, and the word opportunities was in my talk. These differences should be taken as opportunities for further thought, for us all to reflect on what we mean by democracy and what we mean by science, technology, and democracy, and we should be prepared to learn from each other's approaches and mistakes. Uncertainty is something that scientists think they should get rid of, for a political analyst such as myself, uncertainty is a rich opportunity for thinking further, and we should not shortcut people's uncertainty when publics don't know whether they want to accept something or not. The idea should not be to bulldoze them with information campaigns saying, oh, you don't know how to think and you're ignorant, but rather to take seriously what the foundations of the uncertainty are. And last but not least, we need institutions. We need formal and informal bodies where these ideas can be expressed and discussed. And across the world today, I will tell you, there is great need for these sorts of institutions. They do not exist in many places. The GM Nation debate I told you about, where Britain made a whole new public consultation about genetically modified crops, is an example of the basic fact that Britain did not have an institution in place and therefore needed to invent it for the particular conflict. We need more basically and more generally uh, a different way of telling stories about techno-science. Much of the storytelling about technology tends to be what I would call thin description. It focuses only on the technical side of things, so only on what is physical, what is measurable, and what has directly assessed, accessible causes and consequences. Social and cultural meanings of all the techno-scientific stuff that we do tends to get ignored, especially in the policy process, and by a lot of people who are themselves scientists and engineers, and in the media writing about science and engineering. 
The emphasis in techno-scientific and technocratic policy tends to be on what is known, and the system is biased towards making things work, and responsibility has not been a primary concern. In place of that, I would suggest that we need, in order to bring this perfect alliance into being, a much thicker set of descriptions, one that is attentive to human and institutional causes and consequences, not just the material things, that takes into account the social and cultural meanings of technology, that allows for the inclusion of uncertainty and ignorance instead of trying to exclude those phenomena, that generates a memory for technological failures instead of pretending they never existed, and in which responsibility is and remains a major focus of political concern. If so, then we can look ahead to a future of humanity, which is tied to the future of science and technology in the way that Barack Obama promised in his inaugural address. But science and technology should genuinely be in their rightful place, and we should think what that rightful place is. And for me, that is a place that is governed by citizens who have rights of their own, the right to question, the right to ask for explanations of error, the right to hold people accountable, and the right really to imagine their own futures instead of having those futures dictated by somebody else's idea of what a nice innovation would be. So when I came into this room and your soundtrack started playing, the first song was Let It Be, and this again was before I had shown you my last slide, but it seems appropriate that I should also end with the force of imagination and a thank you for allowing me to speak to you this morning. Thank you. So I, I guess if people have questions, they should raise their hand and somebody will bring the microphone to you. Yeah. If you have any questions, raise your hand and the comedy members with microphones will approach you. And for my interest, it would be nice if you would quickly identify who you are. Uh, good morning, Professor Jasanoff, I'm Manisha. Uh, I'm a full-time student here at KAIST. Um, uh, my major is electrical engineering. I'll be a sophomore in the coming semester. Um, actually, I've been thinking about it for a long time, um, especially regarding developing countries, especially India, where I come from. It's like there's a huge gap between like government, which is uh, which has so much of bureaucracy in it, and there's I mean there's a very big difficulty in making use of technology, like bringing science and technology to the, the most common, like the household. There are so many households who do not have electricity even till today. So I believe uh, what could be the way to bridge this gap between the government and the te and technological people who are basically dealing with technology. Um, thank you. That's, um, of course, a challenging and an enormous question that you raise, and one that I'm not exactly unfamiliar with, being also from India and in a somewhat more remote past. Um, but I think that the short answer to um, that kind of question is that uh, a place in which democracy is not working at the political level is not going to be a place where science and technology will thrive as well as possible. It's interesting to remember that in the history of modern independent India, uh, the leader is particularly Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, was an intense believer in technology, and under him and his successors, the Indian KAIST system, if you will, the IIT system, was set up, and it was very much a pro-technology system. So it's worth asking, how is it that that vision 
that was about engineering for India's development, about the use of technology for India's development, went astray. And I think that the, the um, points about bureaucratic inertia are definitely part of the picture, but it's also part of the picture that uh, how people exercise power to do that last thing I was talking about, to have the freedom to imagine their own future, is not that clear in a country that still has huge differences in uh, socioeconomic conditions. Uh, and of course, I live in a country now which is among the richest in the world, but it too does rather poorly on the question of equality and inequality. So in general, I mean, at the very basic level, my message is get the politics right and then you're likely to get you know, more advances. Now, how you get the politics right is going to be a very nation-specific question. And so in India, I think more the strategies of public mobilization and protests, those are likely to work in a way that in America, formal law tends to do that job a lot more of the time. Um, but I think that, that once people really have it in their heads that technology is a form of governance, that technology can be used innovatively for the public good, then the chances of being able to get people to mobilize, uh, to make demands, and to seek out innovations that will help them, those chances increase as well. Thank you. Uh, hi, prof <coughs> hi, Professor. I'm Konya Kim. I'm studying neuroscience at Dickens College. I'm a sophomore next semester. Uh, I was curious about the. Uh, you talked about uh, scientists need to prepare for the new age, and it's pretty hard to do so. I mean, as a as a like future scientist, I'm thinking about being a neuroscientist in the future, and I was like thinking about what kind of mindset should I have, and what is the thing that I need to prepare for the new age. Um, again, a very big door opening question to ask in 2013, where it seems we're still at the dawn of a very new age, especially in the area of neuroscience. Um, coming back home to my parochial setting, uh, not only is my son a neuroscientist at MIT, but also uh, quite recently Barack Obama announced a decade of the brain in which he hopes that there will be advances made in your field that are going to be similar to the Apollo mission. So, how you prepare yourself for the new age can be both very modest and very overwhelming. And maybe you should keep both sides in mind. So at the modest level, keep in mind that we don't ever meet the new age head on. You know, one second moves into the next second and change is incremental. And all you have to do right now as an undergraduate is make sure you do well in your exams and you know get by from one year to the next in a in a very distinguished way and then look for the best job possible and the best lab and the best guidance and so on and so forth. But a lot of my students at Harvard and to some extent at MIT, because I teach MIT students as well, they are thinking about bigger thoughts. They're thinking about how they can get involved in um, solving problems that are genuinely massive and genuinely will confront the world, plus we're going to have knowledge of a kind that brings its own problems. And supposing neuroscience advances to a point where we actually can understand the basis for violent criminal behavior or the basis for more and less intellectual attainment, there are going to be ethical concerns that arise connected with those issues and political concerns because people may decide they would rather have one kind of person and not the other kind of person and there can be genetic tests and so on and so forth. So I think that at the very least it's worthwhile for people in your kind of position to do some work, to actually do some coursework in either ethics or science, technology, and society, to get a sense of the linkage, the very close linkage between science and society. And that too can be incremental. Some people, I've had many engineering and science students who became so fascinated with the science and society area as innovative, new, and 
really energizing that they stopped being lab scientists and started doing STS as a, a field. I tend to tell my scientist students and my medical students, don't do that, but you know, it happens anyway. So you know, you don't know where this will lead you. But at the very least, some degree of immersed, rigorous professional training in science and society issues, science and ethics issues, would be, I think, a good thing for all undergraduates who are in technical uh, institutions today. Thank you very much. Hello, Professor Tetonov. My Hello. name is Hyuan Kim. Oh, sorry. My name is Hyuan Kim, and I'm a biological science student here at KAIST, and I'm also a minor student in science technology policy program here at KAIST. Uh, my question is that um, who your message is targeted toward? Um, the future scientists? Policymakers or the people in um, private sectors or private enterprises. So my question is that whom should be stepping toward for this problem, for solving this problem? Um, thanks. That's a great question. And again, the one word answer is everybody. Uh, but there are uh, groups and institutions that are doing it less than others. So in this room, uh, you're not the prime audience. I think that what's important for you is to recognize that there are people who've been working on these kinds of issues and have been doing so for a long time, and you can, to some extent, take inspiration from them or learn from them or do better than them and so on and so forth. But there are a lot of places in the world and a lot of institutions, a lot of different kinds of actors that don't want to take these issues seriously. So for instance, when I give you an example where even today, uh, biotech companies in America are saying GM trucks and products should not be labeled. Well, what sort of opinion should we have about that? I mean, that's a policy that's driven by industry leaders. It so happens that if you do do the labeling, the sky will not fall in. And in fact, people will be a lot happier because they'll know what they're eating in their food and agriculture. And moreover, there are certain kinds of issues that have not been debated enough, like what are the consequences of large-scale manipulation of plants through biotechnology for worldwide agriculture, what are the consequences for biodiversity, what are the consequences for food security, and so on. So labeling by itself will not solve all those problems, but the labeling dispute is an example of a dispute where some people are not listening to other people. And I think that you being of your generation and in the places you're in in your careers and already well disposed to be good listeners, you have a special opportunity to uh, try to get those of your elders who seem not to be listening, uh, you know, to change their mindset a little bit and uh, thereby help people like me who have been on the frontiers long enough that we would kind of like to relax already and then you take up the torch. Um, due to time constraints, uh, we will take in only one more question. So please raise your hand. Um, thank you very much, Professor, for your interesting uh, talk. I'm Francisco Valencia. I'm from Mexico, but I'm based in Japan in Tokyo Institute of Technology. I have a um, particular question. Your message is really uh, attractive in the way that you're bringing up challenges that I believe are opportunities for young generation like us here. But uh, it's really related to all the questions done before. How we young generation we can get this approach with older generations about us and generally a society that which is risk averse because it's something that I can see it not only in Japan, but also in my country. How we can deal with risk of our societies. Um, thank you. Um, 
So voter generations can be a big problem. But <laughs> you know, myself, being a member of the 60s generation, broadly speaking, I have to say that the 60s generation was more radical in many ways than the 2015 generation that I teach. So you know, I would issue an invitation to radicalism uh, you know, from my vantage point. Um, but um, to address your question more uh, frontally, um, one should be very careful about generalizations like societies tend to be risk averse uh, and ask two things. First of all, what is the empirical basis for thinking that this is true? And secondly, uh, if it is true, is it necessarily a bad thing? Um, so, you know, I think societies are complex institutions and uh, nobody would say that the bankers who invented uh, the derivatives on the basis of which world markets practically got destroyed in 2008 were exactly risk averse. Uh, I'm not sure that we should be applauding that kind of risk taking and maybe a little bit less risk averseness when handling other people's money would actually be a responsible and accountable thing to do. People who do environmental things like I do say that you should treat the natural risk the world's natural resources with somewhat of the same care that you would treat other people's money. People use the concept of nature's capital. So a bit of risk aversiveness in using up nature's capital may be an extremely good thing. And when local people, local farmers throughout the world don't want their farming practices changed from one day to the next, one should ask, why is it that they don't? In general, if people are sick, they want to be cured. If they're starving, they want food. If they're impoverished, they want money. So when people want to stick to the old ways, you have to ask what it is about the old ways that gets valued. And you know, maybe the two most frequent questions I hear are the two that you've raised. One is what can young people do? And two is, what can we do about all those hypothetical people out there who are not like us, not willing to take risks, and so on and so forth? And the answer to both is, I'm afraid, rather clear as far as what young people can do is concerned. There are a thousand things, and look in your backyard and you will find things. There are organizations to help, things you can join. The very fact that you're here shows that you're extremely educated and articulate and able to grasp those opportunities. On the risk aversion questions, keep in mind that you yourself are getting your view of the, what the world is like in a very mediated and reduced way, and maybe you need to be more complex in your thinking about those issues and find that there's some benefit to worrying about risk as well. Thank you.